Hello lovely friends, how are you all doing today? I hope you are well. I am. Um, <clears throat> I am well today. We're going to go back in time a little bit. We're going to look at um, a couple, um, hang on, let me just check. One, two, three. Actually four books from the archive. They were all great. Now just a quick word before we dive into the books. I filmed this in I think January 2022, I was a bit poorly. <laughs> in fact, I was, I was really quite poorly. And a week later, I was in hospital. My goodness, I got a really nasty lung infection. But, 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 thank goodness, my lungs completely recovered and are absolutely fine and unscarred to this day. Yay! So, just as a heads up, maybe listen to this video rather than watch because I do look, <laughs> I do look pretty ghastly, not a stitch of makeup. I look so tight. I look, I look like a poorly person. So please ignore how I look. Yes, I was ill, but I got better. The main thing is the books. Oh, and for anyone who's watched my videos for a while, especially my Christmas videos, they will know how much I hate the Boxing Day walk. It gets referred to again in this video. But then again, I had just filmed it after Christmas, so it was probably on my mind. So ignore how I look, listen maybe rather than watch. Let's dive into four really, really lovely books that I was enjoying in January 2022. And it is, I love, look, it's got this, can I make it glisten and glint? This kind of, oh, there you go. You see the coppery effect. It's Lucy Mangan's Bookworm, a memoir of childhood reading. Some of you may know Lucy Mangan. She writes a column for The Guardian. I remember, oh gosh, it's, this is going back years now when I used to get The Guardian on a Saturday in the colour supplement she used to write an article what was it? I can't even remember what it was about now. I didn't ever particularly like... I, I didn't have an issue with her writing, but her character. I didn't ever really warm to her character. However, I thought, well, I have to give this a go. A memoir of childhood reading. Oh, my goodness. It's an absolute joy. It's such a joy. It starts with really early the really early sort of picture books that are the sort of books we we look at on our own before we're readers but the story is told to us by our parents grandparents what have you and then it goes right through to the sort of teenage years and that cusp of that slight crossover of we're still reading our books which are aimed at young people but we've also started to read adult books too oh, an absolute treasure trove of memories. As each chapter unfolded, I was thinking, I really hope you're going to talk about my favourite book from this sort of genre or this particular period. Sometimes she did this whole section on Sweet Valley High books, which shows, I think she's about seven years younger than me, and it just shows that by the time all the Sweet Valley High stuff came out, I'd long since left my childhood reading behind. I was properly into adult um, reading by then. But, you know, things like Tom's Midnight Garden, or, oh, um, oh, just too much, all the, all the obvious, Alice in Wonderland, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, so, so many. She also talks about the Pull and Thompson sisters who wrote all the pony books. Jill's Pony, Jill's Jim Carner. It was an absolute joy. So I have absolutely no qualms recommending it for anyone who was a voracious reader as a child, as I was, who wants to just wallow in that glorious nostalgia. Just back to that point about um, when I used to read her column of thinking, you know, I liked her writing, but I didn't like her character. My only, my only qualm with this book is, um, I don't know how to put it really, 
she does bang on quite a bit about the fact that, oh, aren't I quirky, aren't I odd for being such a bookworm as a child? You know, it's like by the fourth or fifth chapter, yes, Lucy, we know you were a bookworm. You don't have to keep banging on about it. Um, so I found that ever so slightly, it's kind of slightly um, self-indulgent. Yes, we know you're a bookworm. It says it on the on the book. You don't need to keep banging on. And also, it was kind of odd in a way because, I mean, maybe it is odd. I don't know. She was she was talking about how odd she was for reading so much, and I was thinking, no, you're not. Didn't we all do that? I don't know. Maybe kids our age didn't read that much. I don't remember that. I just remember reading the books and enjoying them. So anyway, that's just a slight neg on it. But for the most part, an absolutely gorgeous, glorious, wallowing in nostalgia read. Loved it. Um, <clears throat> I've talked before about how my book choices, I tend to, there's sort of generally a thread and I'll finish that book and then the the next book there'd be some sort of connection i mean the obvious next book to read would be to reread one of my childhood books but i don't have many of them that had come off reading that had come off the back of something else can't even remember what now but for my next book it was a total <coughs> it was a total break from um from that world yeah total break and i think it was probably also that there was a week or so between books. I didn't do any reading for a week or so. Just trying to get on with other stuff. But yeah, I've been reading quite a bit in the last few days. So, complete different feel. I then went on to read this book, The Wood. Uh, what's it? John, John Stuart Collis. It's just a tiny little book. It's really sweet. Actually, it's... it's it's the kind of lovely pop it in your knapsack kind of book, isn't it? This had winked at me, as all books do, on the um, shelves at a charity shop. And I didn't know the writer, John Stuart Collis, but I thought, oh, well, I'm going to love this. I'll, I'll explain it in a second, but I thought, oh, that looks like my kind of thing. So I grabbed it. What I didn't realise is this is part of a book, I'll show you now, that I already do have. It's the last section of a book that's full of John Stuart Collis's sort of short essays, really, um, all about rural life and working in a, in, I'll explain more in a second, but it forms part of this book, The Worm Forgives the Plough. Isn't that a gorgeous, gorgeous cover? I really like this artist. This is Angie Lewin the cover art isn't that beautiful so it's a bit it's obviously a more chunky book so this is is let me try and show you is start of the book is this section of the book so I already had it <laughs> silly me I have this because a friend recommended it ages ago again ages ago I found a copy second hand, grabbed it while I could because the friend who recommended it to me, I trust her judgment, so I thought, yeah, I'll have it. It's been sat on the shelf for ages. Anyway, the rest of it will be read in due course. Um, but this is all, so this is, the, the writer is an academic, an academic and a writer. And during the Second World War, he was put to agricultural work. So in this particular little section he is clearing and thinning an ash wood oh so lovely it took me a while to to sort of get into his style of writing purely because I'm, I'm suddenly I'm going back 70 plus years and the writing style is so different following on from that Lucy Mangan book but get into it I did how to explain it's not really 
it's all, what, what comes over more than anything on this is his joy of being outside. And this is why I thought, oh, we're kindred spirits. His joy of being outside is about, the joy of being outside, but working. So he talks about, for instance, working in the wood, in the summer especially, really before, when the sun's up, but before the day's getting going, so that by eight o'clock in the morning, he's already done a chunk of work. And at eight o'clock, he can lie under this particularly favorite tree where the sun does penetrate through the wood and lights up this patch of ground where he can basically bathe his skin in the warmth of the sun. It's so delicious. And all the way through, I kept thinking, it, it, so this is what was prompting my thinking of, of, yeah, it's that thing of being outside, isn't it? I love to be outside, but I really love it when I'm working. Either working or simply sitting and staring. It kind of leads into the next book as well, this idea of... I've never been... I've talked about this before at Christmas, how in my family it's traditional to have the Boxing Day walk. Oh, give me strength. I hate the Boxing Day walk. Don't be... You know, let's go for a walk. Let's go for a six-mile hike, then get back in the car and come home. No, why, why would I want to do that? Why would I want on a freezing cold, dreech, miserable day to go outside, tramp around for six miles and then come home? Leave me indoors where it's nice and cosy and I can read a book or chat or watch a movie or anything, anything rather than going for that blimmin' Boxing Day walk. And that got me thinking about how I really don't like going for a walk but I have to, um, I have to qualify that because I do love walking. I've always walked. I've never driven. Um, and in London, um, oh my goodness, I abandoned having a bicycle years ago because it's just, it's too scary to cycle in London. So I've always walked. I walk everywhere. I didn't, I didn't used to bat an eyelid, think twice about walking two or three miles to work. I love it. And even now, um, or actually sort of remembering, I was staying in a cottage, oh I'll tell you this story in more detail one day, but I was staying in a cottage, it's quite remote, and it was winter. We packed all sorts of things to take in terms of food, drink, what have you. Forgot to pack any matches. Couldn't start the fire, couldn't make a fire. And the nearest sort of shop, village, what have you, was maybe two, two and a half miles away. It doesn't bother me at all to go and walk two, two and a half miles to buy a box of matches. Love it. Really enjoy the walk. Enjoy the scenery. Enjoy the sounds and the sights and the smells. And all those things. Love it. Get me a box of matches. Go back. Brilliant. But the idea of just going for a walk, going nowhere and coming back, what's the point? What is the point? I've never understood it. Never understood it. You know, my sister lives in, um, on the North York Moors, beautiful part of the world. And they're really out, you see, I always think I'm kind of outdoorsy, but I'm outdoorsy in a completely different way. I mean, they're outdoorsy, as in, they will just go out all day tramping, <laughs> tramping over, over hill and dale. I'm like, where are you going? You're just coming home. What's the point? <laughs> oh dear, I think maybe I'm too practical about these things. You know, even down at my grandparents, it's like, should we go for a walk? Well, it depends on where we're going. If someone says, should we go for a walk, and it's just a walk in a circle to come back home, no thanks. Should we go for a walk? It's a five mile walk, but there's a really fantastic beach at the end of the walk that's great swimming. Yeah, I'm in, count me in. I'll go for a five mile walk to find a brilliant beach for a brilliant swim. Anyway, so back to Mr. John, um, I just felt like, oh yeah, I've got a kindred spirit at last, that it's that thing of loving being outdoors, but with kind of purpose. That's what it boils down to, isn't it? And I think it's why, you know, yeah, okay, I live in London, I don't live in the countryside, I don't live somewhere beautiful, but those hours and hours and hours that I spend in the garden, um, and sometimes that work is, <laughs> quite brutal on me physically 
but I love it. I I can't I can't imagine I can't imagine now working indoors again. I mean, obviously I do. If I'm sewing, I do that indoors. Um, you know, and it's like that, back to that Boxing Day walk thing, it's not even a weather, because obviously when I'm in the garden, it tends to be, it's generally a lot of the work is done in nice weather. But if you said to me on Boxing Day, do you want to come for a walk? The answer is like, we're gonna be out for six hours on this walk. Do you want to come with us? My answer is no. <laughs> but if you said to me, can you go into the garden, Vivi, and chop logs and split logs for six hours? <sighs> Absolutely, I'd love to do that. And while I'm out there, there'll be moments of stillness and I can hear birds or I can look off into the distance, the view and the, and the hills in the distance and think, oh, what a beautiful lump of rock you are, <laughs> whatever it is, I can enjoy nature and all the beauty. I just don't need to tramp around in it pointlessly. <laughs> have I <coughs> have I gone on that point enough? I am sure there are many of you out there who were dragged around on the Boxing Day walk who also hated it but equally love being outside. So that one naturally led into my next book and this was a gift from Mandy, who I met up with last summer. Hey, Mandy, it was really lovely to meet up. She didn't give it to me on that day, but posted it to me a couple of weeks later and said, I can't believe you haven't read this. And now that I've read it, I can't believe I haven't read it either. It's the slimmest little book. It's called The Living Mountain by Nan Shepherd. Uh, and it's all about her, her time in the Cairngorms which are in Scotland, for those of you who don't know, sort of mountainous area. Now, it's a tiny, tiny little slight book, and there's a whole chunk of it. There's a, it's like two for the price of one. Let me show you, this is all introduction by someone else. Now, I know there are people who, if they bought this, they wouldn't bother reading the introduction, I always do. I'm a bit of a nerd like that. If there's an epilogue, an introduction, it's a prologue, I read the lot. I'll read a bottle of blimmin' juice. I'll read the ingredients on a bottle. But, um, oh, God, I'm sounding like Lucy Mangan now. Uh, the introduction, I'm going to come to Nan in a second. The introduction is by Robert McFarlane. Beautiful, beautifully written. And as I was reading it, um, I had an appointment the other day and I was in the waiting room for ages. So I'd started it in there and all the time I was sort of scratching my head thinking, I know Robert McFarlane, but I can't think of any of his books. Have I read him? Da -da -da. And I know from, from the, this introduction that he must be an outdoors writer. He must be a writer about the natural world, mountains, etc. I thought he must be right up my street. Anyway, it turns out, I will get back to Nan in a second, I do have one of his books on my shelf, unread at the moment, and then I also did a quick Google to, to look at his bibliography. Oh my goodness, having read his writing in this, I love his writing, it, and the titles of the books, I'm definitely going to keep a look at, not this year, because I'm not allowed to buy any books this year. There's an irony to that too, I'll tell you about in a second. But um, it turns out, yes, I've got one of his books on my shelf, unread, and this is why I don't need to buy any books. This book was my treats for a tenner, not, not the one just gone, but the one from the previous year, so the back end of 2000, I had to think then. This was in my treats for a tenner before Christmas, and it's called The Old Ways. Um, a journey on foot. It says, following the tracks, holloways, drove roads and sea paths that form part of a vast ancient network of routes crisscrossing the British Isles and beyond, Robert MacFarlane discovers a lost world, a landscape of the feet and the mind, oh, I love that, a 
pilgrimage and ritual, of stories and ghosts, above, above all of the places and journeys which inspire and inhabit our imaginations. Heck yeah. So, and this is one of the things I love about reading is, it's obvious that um, there are certain books which I'm going to be attracted to more than others, but it's amazing how many times one book will link into another and I hadn't even realised there was a connection. So that's what I mean when I picked this up. What a connection. I've already got one of his books on my shelf. So, is it, this isn't in my read soon pile. I've made another pile. Oh, I just want to read them all in one go. Anyway, back to The Living Mountain. Um, oh, my goodness. It's so beautiful. Obviously, it's very sight. It's incredibly poetic. That kind of really distilled language getting right to the point. The chapters are beautiful. Each chapter has a very specific focus. The water on the mountains, the air, the flora, the fauna, her own senses. And in a way, when I was reading, I was thinking, she writes. What it made me think about was imagining a peregrine falcon high, high, high up above a ravine, just hovering there, focusing on the tiniest little mouse right, right down there in the ravine. So this peregrine falcon is aware of its, all its surroundings, but its focus is just on that mouse and then whoo, down it goes for its supper. And in a way, her that's, that's sort of like how Nan's writing is. Where, as I read her, I'm aware of this huge, vast space, this incredibly hostile in some ways space. And she doesn't shy away from talking about that in terms of deaths that have occurred there. So we're aware of this vast space, but at the same time, she brings me through her writing down to the tiniest, tiniest detail the tiniest bit of lichen clinging to life on a rock, or a moment of, oh, silence. But actually, no, it's never silent on the mountain. Water can be heard somewhere. A flap of a bird's wing somewhere else. It's so focused on these minutiae, but yet we're still in this huge landscape it's truly beautiful. Absolutely. Oh, I think it could be read and reread. I might read it again. <laughs> In fact, as I was reading it, sometimes I, I read some of the paragraphs two or three times because it was so beautiful. This was gifted to me by Mandy. Thank you, Mandy. And this is, I'm going to gift this on to someone who I think will, yeah, really, really love it. It just, I, I just had a flash then of, um, Robin Wall Kimmerer, completely different style of writing, but somehow that same purity of appreciation and observation for the natural world. Gorgeous. That book is mentioned in my next book, and it's a complete jump in terms of um, style of book. Excuse me a second. I'm doing well not coughing though, aren't I? Um, I've got to say though, at night when I lie down, <laughs> oh, and that's why, I mean, I look dreadful at the moment. That's because a serious lack of sleep, but pff, never mind. Um, so I had my, I've got my pile of books next to the bed. There's usually sort of four or five in the pile and it's my kind of selection of what I'd like to read next. Every now and again, it might get completely swapped out because I'll read a book like The Nan Shepherd and then I think I'll blow the selection I've made, get put those back on the shelf and, for instance, having read that, a natural progression would then be Robert McFarlane. That's not happening at this time, though. Um, so, yes, I've got my little selection there and I was about to get stuck into my next book when the postman arrived 
Oh, Jan, you are naughty. I have the most wonderful friends, I have to say. So like I was just saying in terms of I'm not buying any books this year. <sighs> Keep being sent books. Now stop it, you lot. Stop sending me. I don't... I mean, this is, you know, personal friends as well. Jan has sent me confessions of a bookseller. Now, do you remember last year I was sent a diary of a bookseller and it sat on my shelves for ages and then I finally got round to reading it. I think, was it, was it one of the ones I read in December? I seem to remember in December I was spending so much of my reading time in France, either on a barge or cycling around France, tasting food. All those books, by the way, my French ones, I've given those to Paul, he'll like those. Anyway, I loved Diary of, Diary of a Bookseller, and I was saying by the end of it, I was completely in love with Sean, the bookshop owner and the writer of the book, completely in love with all the characters, the bookshop, and after I finished it, I really missed them all, I really missed them all. So thank you, Jan, it sent me this. Um, it arrived about, I don't know, 10 o'clock in the morning, And it's just been in this last few days when I've been really quite low. I think I think a lot of the lowness is just not sleeping. But anyway, I've done a few little bits and bobs that morning, managed a few things, just felt utterly wiped out. And to be honest, feeling miserable. Just I'm just sick of feeling sick. So this, so I opened the parcel. This came out, and I thought, oh, I'll just sit on the sofa for a minute, and I, I'll just read a couple of pages, read the first couple of pages. I scoffed it all in one go, aren't I a greedy pig? All in one sitting, gone. Nom, 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 nom. It's great. If any of you have read the Diary of a Bookseller, is it Diary of a Bookseller or Diary of a Bookshop? It's over on the shelf, can't remember. And really enjoyed it. Oh my goodness, I highly recommend Confessions. It carries on in the same vein. And of course, for me, in my book selling days, all those memories flooding back of blooming awkward customers, people asking stupid questions. You know, people say, oh, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Yeah, there are. There are stupid questions. Shut up. Um, <coughs> look, loved it, loved it, loved it. Highly recommend it. And... Uh, actually, and Jan, my friend here, what was lovely is Jan doesn't live in the UK. She lives over in the States. She'd been listening to it, I think, as a as a talking book. We were just messaging the other day because she was saying, how are you? And I messaged back. I said, oh, I'm just fed up with feeling fed up. And she said, I've ordered you a book. I was like, no, you shouldn't. Anyway, she did. But rather than ordering from Amazon and all that nonsense, she ordered it direct from Sean's shop which is in Wigtown in, in Scotland, ordered direct from him at his shop, and look, signed. How sweet. It says, come direct from... So he's made the money, not Amazon, which is brilliant. But um, the reason I was mentioning that is, I wondered after I'd read the first one, would this only appeal to someone who's been in the book trade? Anyway, Jan's never been in the book trade, she's loved them so i think for a really fun it's dead easy read it's not going to challenge you intellectually at all but the characters are so vivid it's kind of like i feel like i'm just gossiping with old pals when i read it so i finished it and i'm missing it all already that's what i mean it's like I kind of want to write to Sean Bithell, the uh, owner of the shop and the writer of the books, to say, can you produce one of these books every single week? I hear about people, um, what's it called, binge watching a box set, where you get a box set of, I don't know, The West Wing, God, that's how out of touch I am, and you end up watching the West Wing for 12 hours in one day, <laughs> just watch back-to-back -back episodes. Well, that's how it was for me reading that. I binged, it wasn't 12 hours, but um, yeah, I could, I could, oh my God, the fantasy, this is my fantasy life now, is I end up with a rich benefactor, I end up with my very own Magwitch, 
and I'm paid to stay at home and read. Imagine it. Oh, what a great run of books they were. The Lucy Mangan, that was such fun. Uh, the Nan Shepherd, really, really enjoyed that. And I was thinking about her again just recently when, I'm not sure whether you will have seen it yet or whether it's going to be the next one you do see, but I've been reading a Robin Wall Kimmerer book all about moss and I kind of thought of Nan Shepherd as well and, and that kind of real close up looking at stuff. But what I'd completely forgotten about was the Sean Bithell. Which one was in that video? Um, Confessions of a Bookseller. There were two more that I read, I think one before and one after. So I'm gonna try and find those in my archive and bring those to you as well, because they're great, great fun. Really enjoyed them. But for today, uh, with my <laughs> healthy, happy lungs, uh, I'm gonna bid you all a very fond farewell. See you all soon either in the interim for some stuff that's nothing to do with books or in one week's time for some more book chat. Until then, stay well, stay cosy, stay healthy. <laughs> Cheerio lovelies.